Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you here today. Glad to be here with you today. Uh, our scripture reading for this morning comes from First Thessalonians. And the first chapter, verses 9 and 10, and this is part of the uh, greeting that uh, the Apostle Paul is given to the Thessalonians, and he reminds them uh, in the earlier verses what, um, how they had come preaching the gospel to these people, and they received the gospel as the word of God, and it changed their life and changed what they did with their life. In verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, you know, there, there are probably four sermons in those two verses, uh, but the Apostle Paul wants them to know that one of the reasons they have to rejoice is for what God had done through Christ, particularly delivering them from the wrath to come and giving them an eternal home in heaven. And while they're here, these people have been so faithful in serving the Lord that Paul just praises what they've been done how they have preached the word in Macedonia and Achaia. And um, it's to the point that Apostle Paul says, when I get there, I don't even need to say anything. You people have, uh, you've done a good job. And um, I want to say that about our people too. You do a good job. Amen. You're great. I praise you. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful for the blessings that we enjoy today. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Word, for this part that we've read. And we just ask that you'd open our hearts and our minds to it, Lord, and help us to gain what you have for us today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Back in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that the, the high priest who was assigned to the temple in Jerusalem would go once a year through the veil in the temple to the Holy of Holies and offer a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. He did this every single year. Well, Jesus Christ came and made a one-time sacrifice for you and I by shedding his blood on the cross at Calvary. And while the people waited for the high priest in their day to offer that blood sacrifice and see that God accepted the sacrifice and they waited to see the high priest come back on this side of the veil to know that the sacrifice had been accepted. And today the church, the whole church, waits for something to happen. And that's the subject of our message today. The first thing the church is waiting for is for God's Son to come 
from heaven. We're told that he ascended up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God to intercede for us and one day he's coming back. And I jotted down last night on my notes, this world is not my home. I didn't know Fleetie had picked that song out for us to sing today. But this is true because we're waiting for Christ to come from heaven. Philippians tells us that our conversation is in heaven. And that's translated our citizenship is in heaven. So though we may be a citizen of the United States, our real home is heaven. And uh, what a joy to know that we have that to look forward to in the future. Now, we're not waiting as a church for death. We know that the Bible says, for as it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. We know that death is going to come sometime if the Lord tarries. But we're not waiting for that. We're waiting for the one that is called the way, the truth, and the life to come back. And we're not waiting for the Holy Spirit anymore because he was sent to us on the day of Pentecost. And everybody that opens up their heart, he comes in and lives in us. We're not even waiting for the conversion of the whole world to take place. Now the Bible says in Matthew that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into the, all the world and then the end shall come. Now to judge when that's taken place, I don't know. I've seen Billy Graham preach in the past. And if the whole world was not listening, they ought to have been. At the message he brought to the world then. But the whole world is not going to be converted when the Lord comes. And how do I know that? Because the Bible tells us that. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. There's going to be a lot of wickedness in the world when the Lord comes back. We pray for worldwide revival, and we need that, folks. We need it everywhere. And every once in a while, a little revival will spring up and people will begin to be saved. But the Bible doesn't support a worldwide revival in the last days. It just doesn't. It says there's going to be a great falling away before the coming of the Lord. It says that iniquity will abound and the love of many shall wax cold in the last days. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said to Timothy, in the last days, perilous times shall come. So the Bible does not support the fact that we're going to have a worldwide revival. Oh, that would be wonderful. But it says there's going to even be apostasy in the church. <coughs> it says the people in the church who know the truth are going to turn their back on the truth and turn away from the truth and their hearts will grow cold and they will not hear the truth anymore.
But we are waiting for the one who is the truth. And it behooves all of us to remain faithful to him. He has promised to come and deliver us from the hour of temptation which is coming upon all the earth to try those people on the earth that are left here. He's promised, in other words, to deliver us by rapturing the church before the tribulation described in most of the book of Revelation takes place on the earth. So we are waiting for the Lord to come back. Paul describes it in 2 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. At the sound of a trumpet, the Lord's going to come, and the dead in Christ is going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the, Lord, in the air to meet with the Lord. That, that means, what that means is that everybody that knows the Lord, whether they've already died or whether they're living, are going to be with the Lord. Now we know that the Bible teaches us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So our spirit leaves our body and goes to heaven to be with the Lord immediately when we draw our last breath here on this earth. But that doesn't mean that the dead in Christ are going to be put off. They're going to rise to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We'll all be changed. And so the bodies will be given, will be changed, and we will have a glorified body like unto that body that Jesus has. I guess that's what John meant when he said, we'll be like him. So we're waiting for that to happen, for that rapture of the church to take place. And we're waiting for the completion of our salvation. You mean I'm not fully saved? Nope. You're saved, but you're going to keep on getting saved. And after a while, you're going to be fully saved. And you're going to be fully saved when God not only delivers you from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, but when he delivers you from the presence of sin, there, the results of sin are all around us today in the world. But one day when the rapture takes place, we will all be delivered even from the presence of sin. We'll be in a place where nothing can come there that will ever defile it. Now we have to watch suffering and sorrow and participate in it too. But God has just begun a good work and God will complete the work when the rapture of the church takes place. We'll all be made whole and we'll be safe forever and ever from the power of Satan and the presence of sin. We're also going to be waiting for the redemption of our bodies. My soul saved, but my body ain't yet. Okay? It's, it's getting in worse shape, it seems like. <laughs> Y'all notice that too? 
But we have to, the Bible says, with patience, wait for it. Wait for it. And the reason we need to wait for it is because the best is yet to come. According to the scriptures, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like to his glorious body. You see, the soul's already been transformed when you get saved, but the body hadn't. But it's going to be transfigured, transformed, or ever how you want to describe it. We're going to have a glorious body like that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's, good to, it's going to be good to see the Lord when we get there. No doubt about that. But it's going to be better to be like him when we get there. Think about that. Yeah, I want to see him, and I want to be like him. And then we're waiting also for the bridegroom of the church. You know, the church is getting married one day. Yep, sure are. Right after the rapture of the church, in fact. We'll all be up in heaven. Everybody that's ever known the Lord will be in heaven. And the Lord has got a big table prepared, full of food. And we're all going to sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb and enjoy a feast and enjoy a wedding in heaven. Jesus Christ will become the bride of the church. I mean the bridegroom of the church and we will be the bride of the bridegroom. That's what Revelation describes. So if he tarries longer and he waits longer to come, just keep in mind Heaven is going to be worth it all. Wait for it and keep waiting and be patient. Waiting also today for our reward that's been promised to us. The Bible tells us, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. You mean I have to answer for how much I've worked? Yep. And for what kind of work it was too. I have to answer for everything that I've done in the body since I've known the Lord. Now he's forgiven me for all of my sins of the past. And he's going to forgive me of all of my sins in the future. But I'm supposed to be doing something. And if I ain't doing that something that I'm supposed to be doing, I'm going to lose reward. But if I get myself busy, I can stack up a lot of rewards in heaven. That's why Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not, not on the earth. This sort of hard for us to get our mind wrapped around those things that the Lord taught us about that because we are so attached to this old world that we live in because it's, it, it's all that we've ever known is this world that we're living in 
but don't get too attached to it because you're going to be leaving. This world is not your home. You're going to have a new address before long. So let's wait. Let's wait for those rewards that the Lord has promised to each of us for faithful service. The Bible says, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch. Watch and wait. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not the hour when the master cometh home. The Son of Man cometh in an hour that you think not. So be watchful. And last of all, we need to be waiting for a new heaven and a new earth. The Apostle Peter, in Second Peter, describes what's going to happen to everything that we are attached to down here on this earth. He says it's all going to get burned up. The elements, he says, will melt with fervent heat, which, I, which may symbolize the purifying of the earth after the end time comes. I don't know. But I do know this. He poses a question. And it goes something like this. I can't quote it exactly. Therefore, if all of this stuff is true, and this is what's going to happen on the earth, what manner of people should we be? In other words, how should we live seeing that that's going to happen. According to the promise, we are to look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that's all. No sinfulness, no wickedness, no evil, just righteousness. He said, he shall send Jesus Christ whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. And John wrote, a door opened in heaven and I saw a new heaven and a new earth and I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Do you know that's our new home that John saw? Think about it. It's a new heaven and a new earth for new creatures. And that's why we ought not fall behind in the Lord's work because of what we are looking for in the future. It's all important for us to be ready when that time comes, when God says to his son, go get my people. We better be ready. If not, we'll be left behind. One of the saddest things in the world must be to be left behind. They had this uh, educational system, had this uh, thing, no child left behind. Well, I think a lot of them got left behind. Anyway, even though they were trying to prevent that. 
But God doesn't want any of us to get left behind when it comes time to go. So put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in this world and what it has to offer. I don't know how to enforce that or make more force come to those words, but Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth. But keep your eye on the Lord and lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Two things, one of them is temporary and the other is everlasting. And we have to choose which we want. You want to have a little bit or be satisfied with less of the world's goods and then have an eternity to spend with the riches of heaven Or you want to stuff your pockets here and empty them when you get ready to go. That's our choice, isn't it? I pray we make the right one. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, again, we're thankful for your word today and for these scriptures that we are reminded of. That teaches that in the last days, the only thing that matters is that we know you. And Father, we pray if there's one in our congregation today that hasn't given their life to you, that they'll do so, and they'll do so quickly. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.